So we're going to formally start our, our symposium. And it's a real privilege for, for me to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Ule Jorde, who's the section head of heart failure, heart transplant, mechanical circuitry, circuitry support at uh, Montefiore in the Bronx in New York. And Dr. Jorde was born and raised in um, Mentz, Germany, completed his medical school in Hamburg, and to complete develop his doctoral thesis, ended up in New York in the early, in the early 90s. And he was enticed for many reasons uh, to stay and did his internship and residency at Mount Sinai, followed by his cardiology fellowship at Albert Einstein. And he's really risen the ranks, not only in terms of overseeing one of, a few of the largest programs in the country, combined transplant and LVAD, but at the society level and with prolific production in, in terms of research. He's been the formal medical director of heart failure at NYU, medical director of mechanical circulatory support um, at New York Presbyterian, Columbia, and during his reign, the largest transplant, combined transplant and LVAD uh, program in, in the country. Since 2014, as I have alluded to, he's been overseeing the Mont uh, Fior program and is vice chief uh, in the division of cardiology. And that program in New York is a standout with one of the, now the largest combined heart transplant OVAD um, programs. He's the current chair for mechanical circulatory support from the Master's Academy at ICHFT and past chair for the MCS uh, Council. And as I mentioned, his commitment to education and research have been tremendous with over 150 peer reviewed um, publications supported at the NIH level in terms of uh, uh, research uh, contributions. And when I was thinking who is positioned to give us an update on the landscape of transplant and MCS, Dr. Doherty came to mind. So very much appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I was invited because I'm not easily intimidated, but uh, after the presentations, uh, I have to say it doesn't work. It didn't work. Um, it's an extreme privilege for me to be here uh, to personally uh, meet uh, Dr. Noon last night, and it's 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 truly an emotional moment when when you are with people like you and, and you you feel the legacy. So you are very lucky uh, to have Dr. Noon uh, all the time. I'm going to review with you um, heart transplantation and MCS. And uh, if you are in the field, you all know that our two largest trials recently were called endurance and momentum. And I subtitle my talk usually uh, Endurance of Momentum, question mark. But again, after the introduction, I think a better subtitle would have been uh, Bringing Colts to Newcastle, right? So uh, with that said, I have uh, no conflict of interest uh, to disclose other than uh, that I like mechanical circulatory support. And uh, this is a history lesson. I won't belabor this uh, 50 years ago transplant. Um, it's important for us to understand our history, and a person that's often not mentioned is uh, Dr. Kantrowitz, Adrian Kantrowitz, who uh, worked at Montefiore. I want to underscore that. I actually didn't know that until recently, and uh, was almost uh, the first person to do a, a heart transplant in humans. Uh, and it's a fascinating story. If you haven't read the book, Every Second Count, uh, you should read it. Um, Transplantation, 50 years, uh, total artificial heart now, also over 30 years. I will not belabor this, but you see uh, not much has changed. If you look at the right upper corner of the slide, it's Ronald Reagan, and the title is The Tax War Begins. So we haven't, we haven't advanced very far in this regard. Anyhow, heart transplantation, I will just make a very uh, few comments on this. You know that uh, we have somewhat plateaued. Uh, in the past uh, 15 years globally as well as in the US, although there is a slight uptick in the United States. Actually, this year, there were, in 2016, there were 3,100 transplants in the United States, uh, regrettably, I think, in large part related to the opioid uh, epidemic in the United States, but that's where we are. Um, over the uh, few past decades, uh, outcomes of transplantations have improved. I have to say I'm, again, intimidated by the one-year survival uh, of 95% here, that is really incredible. Um, what is not good is uh, transplantation of ECMO. I'm just highlighting this for those who are not in the transplantation field and heart, maybe not so important, but we are about to change the allocation system to put ECMO patients uh, first, and this will uh, clearly affect uh, our transplant outcomes. Important on this slide to see, however, is that transplantation of continuous flow LVADs and uh, sort of native patients, uh, the outcomes are more or less the same, which is good. Um, 
Organ donor shortage is a big topic that I just want to address very briefly. What you see here is the average age of heart transplant donors uh, in uh, North America in green. You can see uh, we are quite conservative. And in Europe, where organ shortage is somewhat extreme, where now you can see that the average age of an organ donor for heart in Europe is uh, almost 45 years old. Just food for thought. Um, Montefiore, uh, again, I don't have uh, as much to say as you, but we are, I would say, an up and coming a program with a great history uh, over the past three years that I've been there. We are at 48, so we're right behind you with the 50. This year, with our best year this year, we are uh, evolving as an LVAD and a transplant program and hope to make uh, contributions, just like your center has done for so many decades. Uh, we're doing reasonably well in terms of uh, the volume. If you're not familiar with these slides, the more to the right, these are all programs in the US, the more to the right, the bigger. Uh, the lower you are, the better your outcome. So you want to be to the right and below the line, and we're doing just fine. You're probably just slightly to the right and just slightly lower than us. Uh, in the New York region, where we're competing under the same conditions, we're doing quite well. Our one-year survival is 92%. Uh, I was very proud of that until uh, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but uh, we're up there with you be above the national average. So what's new in transplantation? Um, I'm a clinician. Uh, First and foremost, I would say, uh, so I'm on call. Uh, I have a 27-year-old male donor. The donor is local. It was head trauma. The patient has normal coronaries. Troponin is two, and the LVEF is 30%. Would you take that heart? So I'm going to tell you that 75% uh, of the time, this heart will not be accepted in the United States. Uh, what if 12 hours later, on a debutamin drip, the ejection fraction is 55%? Would you now take that heart? We have been taking those hearts uh, for quite a while now, but we were inspired to investigate uh, what outcomes of these hearts are throughout the nation. So the paper we recently published in Jack shows that outcomes after transplantation of donor hearts with improving left ventricular systolic function. So we looked at all uh, donor hearts during a nine-year period in UNOS and looked at those hearts that had two sequential echocardiograms where the initial ejection fraction was less than 40 and the next ejection fraction, or the last one before harvest, was over 50. And we indeed found 472 such organs and uh, looked at their outcomes. And you can see here on the slide, after we created a propensity match cohort uh, with donors of the same age, 27 years old, this is the United States, 26% uh, female and uh, characteristics equal uh, to the group that had a normal heart or normally have to begin with. And the outcomes after one, three, and five years are exactly the same as those hearts that are initially normal. Furthermore, because these donors were slightly younger than the average donor, there was less coronary disease after one, three, and five years. So these organs uh, should be used. How are they supported? They were supported with an average dose of uh, four uh, micrograms per kg per minute of debutamin, and usually a triothione. In further details, uh, you can see in our paper. So here is uh, the central illustration that uh, Jack likes you to um, provide. And you can see on top is the brain, brain damage. Then there is catecholamine storm. The heart stops working. And there is left ventricular dysfunction, neurogenic left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, the donor management, I think this is a big issue for us, is not done properly, not standardized, and we are not given enough time to resuscitate these organs appropriately to save lives. But when you uh, implement a hormonal resuscitation, hemodynamic optimization, and catecholamine repletion, there are three possible outcomes. One is the LVEF is worse, do not take the heart. Two is the LVEF is unchanged, you may have to wait. In average, it takes 12 to 18 hours in this study for the ejection fraction to improve. If the ejection fraction has improved, you should take the heart. Now, these are 470 donors, 72 donors, but this is not a trivial observation because every year in the United States, 10,000 hearts are offered for donation. We talk about not enough uh, donors uh, are being signed up. 10,000 hearts offers only 3,000 views. And LV systolic dysfunction accounts for about one-third of unused hearts. So there's a lot of potential in the organs that we already have. And we were hoping that this study would help. 
How frequently are these organs used? You can see on the right lower side of the screen that over the past 10 years, it has gone from 25 to about 75 organs a year. Uh, there are estimates that there are about 800 such organs available in the United States alone. So uh, food for thought. Uh, the second topic I want to touch on very briefly, and again, maybe bringing uh, Colts to Newcastle, it's the same donor at the outset, the F is 55%, but the donor now has a positive antibody for hepatitis C. Do you take that heart? If you want to make a wild guess uh, on how, uh, what is the percentage of such hearts taken in the United States, it's less than 3%. Now, why is that? Because most uh, of us are afraid of the donor getting hepatitis C. I'm not sure, you probably can see this reasonably well. Let me just figure out how the pointer works on this thing. Yeah. You have, um, the, from the donor to the recipient, the, sort of the history of hepatitis C, there's the inoculation in the donor, there is a eclipse period where the donor is completely negative, then the donor will become viremic, then the donor will make an antibody. The viremic antibody positive donor is then used for transplantation into uh, the recipient, the recipient, after about seven to 10 days, will develop viremia and will then develop hepatitis C. This is the natural course of hepatitis C infection with or without immune suppression. What is not as well known, I should say, is that 25% of those that are infected with hepatitis C clear the virus spontaneously. These donors are then antibody positive, but non-viremic. Such organs are not infectious. Now, what is the percentage of these organs in the United States used for transplantation? Exactly the same as the viremic donors. Again, there's a big pool. Uh, we have been routinely using those organs. I believe so have you. Uh, there are some things still uh, need to be studied. We have done uh, 14 such organs uh, this year. And what we have observed is even though none of the recipients develop viremia, despite prospective tight monitoring, three of our recipients developed the antibody to hepatitis C, which initially was a scary observation, but if you study this further, I don't have time to belabor this right now, these antibodies are most likely false positive, as are also seen in our left ventricular assist device patients, who for some reason, 20% of them become hepatitis C antibody positive without really having the disease. So I'm gonna leave that as, as food for thought, and uh, move on to uh, mechanical support. I recognize that later on in this very interesting conference, uh, there are other presentations on DCD donors and so-called heart in the box, as you've already seen by Dr. Geber, so I won't go there. What's old in transplantation? Uh, patients are referred to late. <clears throat> Donor shortage will persist, and 50 to 70% nowadays, at our institution, 70%, we will need a left ventricular assist device as a bridge to transplantation. Um, I do always pause uh, when I give these talks because I don't want uh, the audience to take away that we are uh, hepatitis C hungry transplant and VAT cardiologists that don't understand heart failure. It's extremely important for us to recognize what happens in the real world when we go communicate with our referring physicians. So this is what's happening in the real world. In the real world, uh, about 20 years ago, if you had a New York Heart Association class for a heart failure patient, they would get Lasix and Didroxin, and then half of them would be dead after a year. In the real world, the exact same patient comes in, gets modern neurohormonal blockade, ACE inhibitor, aldactone, beta blocker, and 90% of them will be alive at one year. This is why you have to go have outreach dinners, because you're wondering where these patients are. They're doing very well on uh, medical therapy. Extremely powerful, and we must really understand this. Uh, the new drug, Entresto, I was in Europe last week, and everybody said, oh, now we have Entresto. Maybe we don't need to do transplantation. It should be the first-line drug. I will not belabor this, but the absolute benefit of this drug is a mortality benefit of 2% at two years. It is important. It's a number needed to treat of 50 patients to save a life. We will readily do this, but it's not going to change the landscape of advanced heart failure. So the landscape of advanced heart failure in the real world are patients who can no longer tolerate these drugs, become inotrope dependent, and this is the control group of the REMATCH trial almost 20 years ago. And patients who become inotrope dependent or have a low output state will be dead after two years. 
nothing has changed in the medical therapy of these patients in the past 20 years. Not ARB, not ACE, not Entresto. Once you reach that point where you are a therapy failure, your prognosis on medical therapy remains as grim as when uh, Dr. Nguyen did the first uh, lung transplant here. Um, there are numerous very complicated scores uh, to inform our referring physicians when to refer patients. This was a little mnemonic that was in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant a week ago as a letter to the editor, and I really like this. Uh, I need help is, uh, stands for I as an inotrope, N as in newer class three or four, E as an end organ dysfunction, E as low ejection fraction less than 20%, D defibrillator shocks, indicating worsening prognosis, and then help is hospitalization, edema, low blood pressure, and most importantly, the inability to tolerate modern oral heart failure therapy. So I now just take this and give my talk off this slide rather than showing the Seattle heart failure score and this score and that score that nobody uses. So I need help is the new uh, referral outreach thing. But let me move to um, mechanical circulatory support which um, I, as many in this center, have been quite passionate about. We uh, started with the HeartMate One device, as you all know, a wearable device that had, um, can you play this? That had uh, two valves, an inlet valve, an outlet valve, and then a relatively big chamber that pumped volume displacement pump. And for those of you who are not familiar, you can see how this device is uh, connected right here to the left ventricular apex, sits in the belly, very big pocket, and then to the aorta. This was quite big, uh, weighed a kilogram, and um, it was a seminal study uh, led by Eric Gross in conjunction also with centers down here that showed that if we randomized inotrope-dependent patients to remain on inotrope or to receive a device, oops, uh, at one year, there was a quite incredible 25% uh, uh, survival benefit. And patients also reported that they felt better with this big device than on medical therapy. So 25% absolute survival benefit, that is not trivial. That means you treat four patients, 100 divided by the absolute percentage, and you save one life. There are not many things that we do. So at one year it was great, but at two years, everybody had died. So enthusiasm for this device as an alternative to transplantation was minimal. The device was approved, I believe, in 2001 as a destination therapy device. But in 2008, sort of on last count that I did, there were only 300 uh, such devices used in the United States, a country of 300 million, as destination therapy. This was too big, too bulky, too loud, and didn't last long enough. Now, we have come a long way uh, since this time, and you, of course, are all part of this history, recognizing, uh, and I don't know um, how people could be this bold, recognizing that we don't need parts touch flow as humans where uh, you can look in any physiology textbook and you can see this inside the left ventricle. We have a pressure of 120 over five or so in the uh, arteries in the arm here, 120, 80, the blood pressure we take. But as we go down uh, into the uh, periphery, into the capillary bed, there is indeed no possibility right there. So why uh, do we need it? Well, um, we don't. Uh, as it turns out, now over 30,000 non pulse type pumps globally later uh, we have come to understand that uh, any organ in the human body can be supported with continuous flow and a steady, non pulsatile pressure in the system of 80 millimeters mercury. So there are a number of pumps uh, that I will briefly mention here that exist. Uh, and of course, here's the uh, Reliant AVAT that's currently in testing. I'm not sure in here, but certainly in, in Europe right now, the um, follower of the Micromed DeBakey pump. Um, so let me start with the HeartMate 2 device, uh, only because I want to illustrate some concepts. This is the most used device about uh, 20,000 times now worldwide, I think. Um, here's uh, the housing, the inside, the connections I already showed you. The housing is here. There's a little screw that propels the blood uh, forward, and the screw is hung up, uh, importantly, on two bearings. This is an axial flow pump with uh, two bearings, and I will return to these bearings and their importance uh, for adverse events uh, in a minute. Um, but to summarize, uh, the prognosis of a destination therapy patient 15, 20 years ago or today, if remains on medical therapy and is not assigned uh, to receive an assist device, even though the patient might be a candidate, two-year survival essentially zero, the pulsatile area 
uh, two year survival about 23%, and then the continuous flow LVAT area, two year survival of patients who remain on a device as destination therapy is now uh, 70%. And again, I like uh, to, for those of you who don't do this every day, uh, don't remember uh, uh, everything I said about the history of pumps, but just remember this. Uh, if you have a patient who is the destination therapy candidate, and I need help patient, yeah, uh, and the patient remains on medical therapy, uh, the two-year survival is not good. If this patient is assigned uh, to a you know, modern uh, continuous flow LVAT, the expected survival at two years is 70%. We're now talking an absolute survival difference of 70%, which is uh, unprecedented uh, anywhere else in medicine. Despite this, uh, patients are not referred for assistive device therapy because the message is just not out there, I believe. So this is where we are. There are some other uh, highlights. Uh, we also have some highlights. We had a patient uh, on a uh, HeartMate 2 left ventricular assist device while I was uh, at Columbia, and the woman uh, actually uh, got pregnant while on device. This in itself is very important. If you take care of younger women with severe advanced heart failure, you will know that they may not menstruate anymore. They may not be fertile because of the heart failure. Here you have restoration of menstruation and fertility. When we found out that this woman uh, was pregnant, and this was one of the most humbling moments of my career, so I personally encouraged her repeatedly not to have this child because we found out that she was pregnant four months uh, into the pregnancy. She had been on ACE inhibitors, warfarin, other teratogenic drugs. She already had three children. We, we didn't think she would uh, survive the surgery, and we felt that the chances of this baby to live were very low. Well, you already know the end of the story. Nine months later, with uh, 40 uh, people in the operating room of all disciplines imaginable, <laughs> She delivered a healthy, uh, a, a healthy baby boy, and this is the front uh, page of Journal of Heart and Lung, I don't know, two or three years ago. So, amazing story. I like to, to, to show this picture for two reasons. One, restoration of quality of life of the patient, including you know, sexual relations, uh, including having family, and B, that even a uh, placenta or a fetus growing doesn't necessarily need standard uh, pulsatile flow, because by the time the blood gets to the fetus, there is not much pulsatility. Um, this is the end of the uh, MCS commercial, yeah? Uh, not sponsored by anybody, I wanna underscore that. Um, but here is um, essentially what we reported two years ago. It was kind of the, one of the uh, last recent studies on where do we stand, and we showed in this study that 60% of patients, both in clinical trials, and in commercial practice after rollout of the HeartMate 2 were alive, fantastic. What is not talked about as much is the fact that yes, they are alive, but how many of them are alive without a serious complication? And now we're talking business. In the trial, only 24% of the patients on the HeartMate 2 were alive at two years without a serious infection, a pump exchange, uh, or a pump exchange. This is the 24% that you see right here. Now that's a little bit humbling. That is uh, reminding us of uh, the HubMate 1. Uh, this was the life. However, in the uh, post-approval study, where centers had more experience, where patient selection had improved, this number rose to 43%. Now you may not like the 43%, of only every other patient being alive and well after two years. But this slide is a very, very important slide because it tells us several things. Survival alone is not good enough in 2017 if you're in the mechanical support field. There is a 19% absolute improvement in serious adverse event free survival without any change in the technology. The exact same pump. So do we need better pumps, or do we need better doctors? And I'll get back to that later. I feel that uh, the pumps are quite good right now. <laughs> okay, not everybody can be Dr. Noon. So uh, what's the catch-22 of elevator therapy? It is very clearly the hemocompatibility and the interaction with the vasculature of these pumps. On the left, you see, uh, uh, this is a hardware thrombus here. This is a heart made two uh, thrombi here. 
And on the right, you see arterial venous malformation in the small bowel. I will get to this back to this in a second. Uh, the balance of bleeding and clotting is what we are currently uh, struggling with in the support. You probably know this paper. If you don't read the New England Journal, that's fine. If you read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, this was in the Wall Street Journal big time. This showed uh, four years ago now that there was a dramatic increase in pump thrombosis in the HeartMate 2 device. And again, this is a long story. I can't uh, really take this apart all the way. Let me just say that uh, there was grave concern that up to 20% of patients would develop a pump thrombus with this pump, and something had changed uh, with the manufacturing, and that this thrombos, thrombus would occur early on. Um, we uh, learned a lot about pump thrombus uh, during that time. Number one, thrombus is not thrombus. Same pump here, four, four heart made two, so you can see pump, 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 very different. You can imagine that you may want to tackle this maybe with a thrombolytic, but you're not going to tackle this with a thrombolytic. That's just there. It's not going to go away. We also learned that the position of the cannula is very important and may change over time, and that that may be a reason for pump thrombosis. So here's a doctor, right? In this case, a surgeon. And then we learned that some patients just have hypercoagulable disorders, like this 21-year-old who, after four weeks on the pump, just completely totaled it off with a hypercoagulable disorder. Um, we uh, began to understand that uh, hemolysis is a early sign of uh, pump thrombosis and that through ramp studies, placing the echo probe on the patient, dialing the pump up and down, see how the ventricle behaves, we could infer whether there was a hemodynamically significant uh, pump thrombosis. And, and Nia Oriel, who was uh, one of my fellows, uh, has made an incredible career and is probably uh, better known than any of us at this point uh, and taken this uh, RAM study business to very high levels. But message here, we, um, we were able to identify the pump thrombus earlier, and I will return to this in a minute. But in the field, thrombus was a major issue. Efforts were made uh, by the industry uh, to develop pumps that would not have a clot, and if you have recently seen uh, the England Journal of Medicine, uh, about six months ago or so, uh, we reported the results, uh, the first United States results with the so-called HeartMate 3. And the HeartMate 3 was in configuration and function much like all the other pumps, but it was wider inside uh, with wider gaps. And there is a little uh, artificial pulse in the pump that is not designed to give the patient a physiological pulse but rather to every two seconds disrupt possible stasis zones inside the pump so no clot uh, could form in there. This pump uh, was then tested, and uh, in 300 patients initially, about 150 in each group, randomized, and the long and the short of it is that the outcome at six months um, with the HeartMate 2 here, uh, event-free survival was about 75% or so, and with the HeartMate 3, was 86%, so clearly better, statistically significantly better, a small step maybe in the right direction, but the big step was in the serious adverse event profile. None of these patients had a thrombus, uh, none of the pumps, I should say, uh, developed a thrombus inside the pump. These are the first published data. There are now uh, probably about 2,000 patients implanted worldwide, and I think there's one anecdotal report of a thrombus. So this is truly now a, a thrombus-free pump. That's a big step uh, for our field, but now the balance remains bleeding and clotting. Was there less bleeding? One other thought was that because of the wider gaps inside the pump, it may be more hemocompatible. There may be less destruction of von Willebrand factor, which is important in this scenario. This has actually been shown in the laboratory, but when you look at the results of the study, gastrointestinal bleeding, which is a major issue for us, actually was equally frequent with HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3. Now, I like to always put in perspective absolute numbers, right? When you think about Entresto, nothing against Entresto, highly statistically significant, 20% uh, relative reduction and so on, but it's absolute 2%. When we look at adverse events, I like to look at the absolute rate of events. And here you can see that 15% of patients, that's one in six or seven patients, 
has a bleed on this device in the first six months, it requires a blood transfusion. That's not a joke. That's one in seven patients. This is not surgical bleeding. This is usually a gastrointestinal bleeding. So we still uh, have a big problem. The other thrombotic event um, that is very important is stroke device. Thrombosis was at the forefront because it was so common and we had to deal with it. But stroke, possibly in relation to device thrombosis with a piece of the clot going off into the brain is also very important. We're still struggling with the stroke rate. The stroke rate uh, is approximately 10 to 15 percent uh, in the first year. Some of these strokes are perioperative. That happens, you know, if you have bad aorta or something like that. Uh, but direct comparison between trials is somewhat difficult because uh, we don't really have unified uh, stroke definitions uh, for clinical trials. Uh, how are we doing uh, with strokes in this arena? This is uh, the endurance study, part of my title slide. The endurance study was a study comparing the uh, hardware or HVAT device, with, which you might be familiar, slightly smaller, I showed it earlier, slightly smaller than the HeartMate 2, an easier operation for the surgeon from what I'm told, I'm not a surgeon, um, but the hardware device um, in the initial two-year study showed equivalent survival to the HeartMate 2, was exactly the same, but there was a very uh, big difference in strokes. The strokes uh, with the HeartMate 2 were in 12% of patients and in 29% of patients uh, with the hardware device. This became a big issue. You know, we have an issue, we'll make things better. You know, in the beginning, you will have issues. So the investigators here said, why did patients stroke? They analyzed the data and they identified blood pressure in the HVAT patients as a very significant independent risk factor for stroke. So they designed a follow-up study. They said, we're not done yet. We're going to do a follow-up study called the endurance supplement, and we're going to subject the HVAT patients that had such a high stroke rate to a very strict blood pressure control protocol, and we're going to reduce the stroke rate. And so um, they did the endurance follow-up trial, and this trial only lasted, lasted one year. So for point of reference, I'm giving you here the 22% one-year stroke rate in the original study. I'm now showing you here that in the original study, the blood pressure mean was 87 or so with the HVAT. And in the follow-up study, same device, the blood pressure was, uh, I can't really see this way from here, maybe around 10 points uh, lower than that. And the hypothesis was, if we lower the blood pressure, less stroke. And guess what? Um, they were right. The uh, stroke, the overall stroke rate dropped uh, you know, not statistically significantly, but meaningfully, I would say, and there was actually a statistically significant reduction uh, in hemorrhagic stroke. This is a very important study just to show us that uh, it is how we manage the patient that significantly contributes to the outcomes, which I tried to allude to earlier when I showed you that the uh, serious adverse event survival is, you know, there's a huge learning curve for us to see. Uh, at the end of the day, the stroke rate with the hardware device is still slightly higher, but now they're kind of getting and they're closing, they're closing in on, on the HeartMate 2 device. Uh, what the hardware device has, again, this is somewhat complex, but I at least want to mention it, it's a very beautiful uh, log file program where you can look at the pump, you can retrieve the log files, and you can see what's going on. And uh, we, we published a paper uh, maybe two years ago where we showed that using these log files, we can identify those patients that will respond to TPA. This is a very different approach uh, with this device. And I think that uh, this is still an untapped potential, and that company is doing a lot of work in this regard. You can look at these log files, and you can basically uh, say, when, when did what happen, and where might the clot be in this case? Uh, future trials uh, that we have to do, is blood pressure also important in the other devices? Maybe we can get the, the rate even lower if we'd always do this. Um, there's now evidence coming out that even if you have a stroke with a better controlled blood pressure, the stroke uh, might be less severe. The big question in our field is right now, given the fact that the new HeartMate 3 device had no thrombosis but had the exact same number of strokes, what is the mechanism of stroke? Where we first thought, oh, I had thrombosis, clot, close close to the brain stroke, there seems to be a completely different mechanism. So to mitigate stroke risk, of course, we have to understand uh, the mechanism. Uh, hemolysis is something I mentioned earlier, which I want to focus on a little bit going forward here. Um, as I had mentioned to you earlier, the HeartMate 2 device had very frequent, uh, very frequent, 10% per year or so, 
uh, device thrombosis. We worked on this early on and we demonstrated that if you leave the device in, in the face of hemolysis, you would have a stroke or die and have a chance of that of about 50% at six months, so it's pretty bad. If you ever remove the device early on, the patient will go on without a stroke or death, and this we published maybe a, a year or so ago. And at that time, uh, the thinking was very clear. Like we, sometimes we, we think we understand things. It was very clear, the patient has hemolysis. Oh, the patient had developed a thrombus, and the thrombus causes the hemolysis, and if we take the device out, everything will be good. Uh, we um, then advanced the uh, clinical paradigm from not monitoring hemolysis to overt pump dysfunction to device exchange to patient death. The patients would usually die. To the current paradigm, maybe not, not so super new paradigm, to monitor clinically, to do these RAM studies, maybe look for some end organ function that's minimal, creatinine from 1.2 to 1.5, take the pump out. But we are really thinking about the proposed paradigm where the hemolysis uh, might be uh, the trigger, irrespective of abnormal uh, echocardiogram studies, to just remove the pump. Uh, we since understand that the chicken and egg question of thrombus and hemolysis may, uh, it may be a chicken and egg question where we don't know the answer because it is well established uh, in hemolytic diseases such as sickle cell disease that um, a blood cell that lyses, the free, rhesus free hemoglobin, can activate platelets and this can lead uh, to thrombosis. So it's actually not the thrombus that's there first, but for some reason a low level degree of hemolysis that then promotes thrombus formation. And maybe indeed that is the therapeutic target rather than subjecting the patient to an operation in phase two. And indeed, we looked at this uh, and recently reported this, mind you, uh, retrospective analysis where we looked at patients with low level hemolysis uh, that, um, and at their, at their stroke rate and event rate, and we looked at patients with moderate low-level hemolysis that were not on agents that might block the platelet activation process, i.e. sildenafil, and they had a high thrombotic event rate. This was completely aborted by giving a sildenafil. Again, this is kind of early pioneering, retrospective, maybe we're wrong, but in concept, I want you to understand that we were moving away from the pump itself to medical therapy uh, in these patients. Mechanical circuit to support durable devices, a niche. Dr. Geber said it earlier, you know, the, the hourglass uh, example, I liked it. Uh, this MCS is trivial in the world of cardiology, right? I'm amazed so many people are in this room right now. Uh, it's really about the broader picture of cardiology and short-term support. There are about 10,000 impeller pumps used uh, in this country every year and growing. And guess what? Hemolysis, uh, if you have hemolysis in impeller pump, that's bad. Uh, bad things happen. ECMO, you must be a very busy ECMO center. Hemolysis on ECMO is associated with embolic events. Do we maybe have to intervene earlier with hemolysis in patients on any mechanical support? I think that's a big question uh, for the next uh, five to 10 years. And there are such trials uh, underway. Um, there's a PREVENT2 study, aspirin versus placebo in the heart rate two. You know, are there other studies, prevention and mitigation of hemolysis and long and short-term support? There are long-term studies in Europe going on. And then this is all hemolysis. I haven't gotten to bleeding, which I will spend uh, my last uh, five minutes on. Bleeding, again, we thought 10 years ago, we completely understand this, <coughs> when we discovered that just like in Haida syndrome, a aortic stenosis patient, no device, destruction of von Willebrand factors, they would present with uh, bleeding, absent from Willebrand factor, and arterial venous malformation in the small bowel. Classic syndrome described, I believe, in 1954 by Haider. We uh, realized that uh, assist device patients, after the Evert implantation, have the same high shear forces, destroy the von Willebrand factor, and then have GI bleeding. And in a paper that, again, uh, Dr. Uriel, uh, my good friend, published uh, with us uh, a few years ago, we showed that during that use, each and every single patient in HeartMate 2, and this is now known for HVAT, uh, ECMO, Impella, you name it, any of these devices will destroy you from Willebrand factor and infer a bleeding diathesis. Uh, they all have it, and if you transplant them, guess what? It goes away. 
This is clearly uh, device induced, and we said, aha, this is why they bleed. Not so simple. If 100 patients have it and only 15% bleed, why do the other 85% not bleed? Uh, another observation is that patients very frequently on continuous flow LVADs develop uh, arterial venous malformations. And actually, a um, very important journal, uh, I didn't make this for today, I had the slide in there uh, before, uh, summarized studies on this, and basically, um, Guha, maybe he's in the room, showed that over 50% of GI bleeds in LVAD patients, CFL patients, are from AVMs, whereas in general populations, maybe 3%. The other bleed from something else. Um, why does this happen? Uh, it seems that there may be an asso association with pulsatility, where uh, River Pinzon showed a few years ago, event-free survival is much higher if you have pulsatile flow on a continuous flow pump rather than when you have non-pulsatile flow. Now, this may sound wrong to you because I just explained to you earlier it's pulsatile or it's non-pulsatile. Well, that's not true because uh, we have a device sitting in the left ventricular apex sucking the blood out. Blood comes in from the left atrium. If I crank up the device really high, it will completely suck into the pump and go into the aorta. If I drive the device at a lower speed, the heart may fill enough to still empty through the aortic valve, right? And the contractility of the pump itself may push blood through the pump. So in reality, when we look at so-called continuous flow LVADs, yes, the LVAD is continuous flow, but they are not non-pulsatile, right? Uh, there is a, a spectrum of about zero to 40 millis, millimeters mercury of pulsatility with an average of 15 millimeters. Maybe these vascular malformations are found in those patients who have no pulsatility. This is something we can manipulate. Um, very difficult to study arterial venous malformations. If you're here, you've had a patient, they come in, they bleed, you call everybody, you scope them, you go in a small bowel, it's all gone. Right, not there. Then there's some heparin trying to make the patient bleed. So this was a major barrier for us. But recently, uh, we recognized that the nasal mucosa, you can do a nasal endoscopy, is possibly a window into the gastrointestinal tract. And maybe we can study the nasal mucosa to predict bleeds. And indeed, in our own uh, cohort, again, retrospective, uh, hypothesis generating, all those words, uh, only patients with nasal hypervascularity had AVM bleeding from the intestines. So we have come a long way here from just understanding from Willebrand to realizing that it is um, uh, much more to it. There's uh, angiectasia formation probably driven by angiopoietin. There are multiple theories to this. I want to close. I know I'm slightly over time. I want to close with our own theory on how the droxin may interfere here. We believe that non pulsatile flow causes splanchonic hyperperfusions. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Noon and the cardiac surgeons know this from bypass in the OR. Hypoxia, uh, a factor is released, the factor releases angiopoietin 2, and so on, and eventually you bleed. The droxin happens to block this factor. In fact, when we look in our own uh, cohort, patients on the droxin uh, will not bleed after about a month on uh, a continuous flow left ventricular assist device, and even more impressive, I think, when you look at the cause of bleeding in continuous flow LVAD patients who are on the droxin, about 30% have angiodysplasia bleeding, but the patients who are not on the droxin, it's 80%. So we believe that this is a pathway that needs to be further studied and that the droxin uh, may play a role here. So summing it up, uh, LVAD therapy is truly, just like transplantation in the pioneering days, a tale of learning. The learning uh, continues, and I think um, everybody knows who this is. Uh, we, we may have to uh, stop thinking a little bit about device, 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 and, and realize how important it is to manage. And we have to go away from this uh, approach as a VAT center where the patient is passed on from doctor to doctor and establish a, a team approach. In the interest of time, I won't belabor this, but we have a very defined team approach at Montefiore, uh, where certain processes, like a weekly meeting, daily intensive care unit rounds with the surgeon, with the intensivist, with the pharmacist, are mandated. I will attend these rounds and make sure that everybody plays ball. We have special blood pressure clinics for the VAT patients, and we implemented this approach three years ago. These are our results. 
These are only had my two patients to allow comparison. Uh, from 2012 to 2014, you can see the one-year survival is 75%. We have not lost a patient in the first year of support since January 2015 on two. now up to about uh, 80 patients or so. That's what you call lucky, okay? But just to top the 95 uh, <laughs> transplant. Now, what about serious adverse events? Again, uh, again with the old device, heart made two, what we call the heart team uh, mechanical support approach, we really have very good results with actually, we only had, this is not on here, we only had one stroke in the last 80 patients that was uh, disabling uh, and may actually go away because she's walking again. But this is a team approach, which I think is absolutely critical, integrating all these things uh, that we talked about. And uh, so I want to end with that slide and thank you for having me in this wonderful institution. <laughs> Dr. Jordan, as expected, uh, <laughs> delivered, and thank you for that excellent review. It's, it's not easy to capture updates of transplant nuances and bring it into MCS, and so I very much appreciate your talk. We do have 10 minutes um, for questions, and so I want to open that up to the audience now. Um, Dr. Hardy, this was a great talk. Um, I'm also one of the advanced heart failure cardiologists here. My name is Imad. Um, I have one question regarding uh, your comments on LVAD as destination therapy. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is survival. Um, as you know, our stage D heart failures that are DT candidates are also have a lot of comorbidities, and readmissions is a big problem after LVAD as destination therapy. So one thing is survival, one thing is quality of life. My question pertains to destination therapy LVAD patients over time, I feel and we think that what's going to really hold uh, true is how their RV behaves over time. Mm -hmm. And that is what's really going to determine their exercise capacity over time, I think, or how they're going to have complications and more admissions. How do you think we can mitigate this problem, uh, sir? Yeah, so I, I do agree with that. Avi, I know there's a dedicated lecture uh, uh, later on. Um, we, we do not see as much RV failure as is reported. So our, um, you know, RVAT rate is quite low, and then probably you also used the, the RVAT earlier. But long term, I think, yes, uh, right ventricle understanding that the heart is not a pump, but rather two pumps in series, right, where we're supporting the left side of the heart. I also believe that managing the right ventricle properly is a major uh, component of excess capacity. What we uh, do, for example, right now in the research lab, uh, in heart failure itself, it is very well established that patients have chronotropic incompetence, i.e. heart failure patients cannot raise their heart rate properly. This is unrelated to the beta blockade. And the sicker they get, uh, the less they can raise the heart rate. When you exercise with an LVAT, uh, as, as you know, the LVAT speed is more or less fixed, just a little bit more preload maybe, but the right ventricle or the heart still has chronotropic incompetence. We are actually presenting some data at the ICHRT that's upcoming where if we exercised patients and turned their rate response on, forced rate response, that their exercise capacity improved. Importantly, uh, aerobic capacity and six minute watt rather than peak because you just can't force the pump uh, to do more. There's now also um, a lot of research also being presented at ICHRT about uh, the CRT lead. You know, when you put the Elvat into a patient who has CRT, what do you do? Do you turn it off? Do you save the battery for the ICD? Do you pace them left? Do you pace them right? Uh, turns out that, or it may turn out, I should say, that uh, right-sided pacing in that uh, subset is actually better than left-sided pacing. So I think, yeah, chronic RV management, you know, pharmacologically, digoxin, sildenafil as needed, but also the manipulation of the right ventricle is very important. Thank you for excellent talk and really a wonderful talk on the whole landscape of MCS. And first, congratulations on your outcomes. As, as one baseball general manager said, luck is the residue of design, and clearly a lot of design went into, went into that. Uh, two questions. One is in terms of your blood pressure management in your, your clinic, mm -hmm. what are you doing to adjudicate pulsatility or not? Is it simply... Oh. 
Very good question. So there are very many sophisticated uh, algorithms for this. We were very simple. If we can feel a pulse, uh, the target is 105 with that pulse because that's systolic. If we can't feel a pulse, it's the Doppler is 80. That's our upper level. And you're simply going by the physician or the nurse's? Yes. Yeah. And you know, generally, we, we've studied this also. Um, generally, uh, you know, we've looked at like three people feeling a pulse cardiologist, surgeon, and, and a nurse. Uh, actually, not a surgeon, they're not around. Um, and then we actually determined with the A-line what is the pulse amplitude. You can feel a pulse, uh, most people can feel a pulse if the amplitude is over 50 millimeters mercury, which would then move the uh, opening pressure closer to systolic. So that's, that's what we do. And the second question relates to the, the stroke rate. And, and yeah. one, one thing we, I, you didn't have time in uh, with the whole landscape of MCS that you covered is infections. And we've shown and others have shown that infections might be related, especially bacteremia might be related yes. with the stroke rate. And yeah. Daniel Goldstein had published on the risk of worsening survival with sepsis uh, or driveline infections in general. Yeah. So, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, no question about it. Uh, I think no question about it. Infection pro-inflammatory state, pro-thrombotic, stroke, uh, or even, you know, mycotic aneurysms in the brain. Um, I just, from our very own experience, again, in the last 80 patients, uh, we had three strokes. Uh, one of, in the two only. We do other devices, I, I, just for comparison purposes, I only mentioned the uh, me too. Um, only one of those strokes was uh, disabling, and this was uh, basically in the, um, you know, in the first two or three weeks after surgery. I'm honestly not sure what happened. Uh, but other than that, we really have very few strokes. And I believe, uh, that, I believe that the first uh, you know, week or two after implant, especially uh, in the intensive care unit, uh, you know, puts the patient on a trajectory. About half the strokes occur early in assist devices. And then after that, it is blood pressure. But to reduce stroke uh, in all comers, I think to have a clear understanding of intensive uh, unit management of these patients and being able to execute it. And with all respect to, you know, uh, legendary surgeons, a surgeon cannot be in the operating room and manage the patient at the same time. And you know, we have the usual, in many centers, and hopefully I'm not getting in trouble here, uh, the surgeon comes in you know, before the sun rises, goes through, and then goes away and says, I'll be back later. Others come in uh, to manage the patient, and you're smiling already. Um, <laughs> others come in to manage the patient, but unless, unless the surgeon gives permission to do this, this will not be executed. So you experience delays. Having worked with many surgeons, having worked in many centers, I understand this. I understand that the surgeon who did the operation has a relationship with the patient like no one else. But there are practical aspects. So when I came to, I developed this uh, kind of at Columbia, this concept with Yoshi Naka, who was a very highly regarded surgeon. Uh, and when I came to my new place, uh, Montefiore with Danny Goldstein, who was a big name also, I said, look, I come here under one condition, and that is that my first six months, you will make rounds with me together in the intensive care unit, and so that people understand that I am your authorized surrogate. And so now, he can be in the OR, and I can go in the ICU, and everybody understands this is a very difficult, I didn't have time in the end to, to belabor this, but I think the key thing is for the next level of uh, mechanical support, just like with aortic valve, the heart team and so on, that people uh, get together, teach, I've, I'm in the operating room actually a lot. They call me in and they say, what now? So when the patient comes out, I know exactly what happened. I know what finger was in where, what, what hole was stitched up on the right ventricle. It wasn't just some magic. Uh, and this is extremely important to, we learn from our failures, I think, this is, this is kind of the legacy of, of the great surgeons here. You have to be open and you have to build a real team. I'm going, it's like a sermon now, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> this, this will be very quick. I was intrigued by the use of sildenafil. Um, the problem with sildenafil is where it acts in the NO cycle, uh, free nitric oxide is 
taken out of the mix by the presence of free hemoglobin. So the very thing that's sort of starting the whole sequence down is going to make sildenafil less functional than something like Rio Ciguat, which is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. Have you given any thought or has anybody considered or are there any papers on using Rio instead of sildenafil, uh, even perhaps at lower doses? I think you yeah. might get No, that's results. a great idea. I haven't, haven't, uh, haven't thought about it. So in terms of uh, excellent talk, and thank you for uh, also citing my, you know, my paper. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I gave you my account number, right? <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, interesting, uh, just to uh, continue with what Dr. Frost said, you know, we use dipyridamol, which is a PD-3 inhibitor, and uh, though we haven't looked at exactly whether, you know, of how that contributes in uh, compared to sildenafil. We've had one patient with uh, Rio Sigwart who uh, we are really using it for persistent pulmonary hypertension post uh, LVAD, which has not responded to sildenafil. But um, we, that uh, would be interesting to actually look at whether, the, the, mm -hmm. because the patient does have a history of GI bleed, so we'll look into it and see if she <laughs> does not have any more GI bleed. Yeah, uh, another great point. You know, actually, I never thought about this either. The, the initial prescription in the HAPME2 studies was Coumadin, aspirin, and dipyramidol. And after six months, and at that time, nobody talked about thrombosis. It was not a topic. At that time, um, after six months, I should say, only 30% of the patients were still on triple therapy because they couldn't tolerate it from bleeding. So maybe actually the, the being on dipyramidol, uh, you know, worked with a low-level hemolysis. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I just, well, just one last question. Brian Brechter here, surgical director. Enjoyed your talk. Very, very good summary. We're like this. <laughs> I, I know Yoshi very well. But anyway, I'm going to ask you a very philosophical like, last question here. Uh, the, the, it's a difficult question, and it's very loaded. When do you, do you see a day when the quality of life on the LVAB will approach that of a transplant? Yes. Easy. When? Uh, when, 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 you, when? Okay, no. we have no time for further no, no, questions. It, Thank it's, you. Um, it, 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 it's, no, it's a whole other lecture, <laughs> no, I but it's fair, because I read all your articles. I mean, you're a pioneer when the, the drive line goes. Yes. When the drive line goes, I think yeah. transplant will move to uh, restrictive cardiomyopathies, uh, you know, uh, anatomies that are not uh, amenable to easy left side support. That, that's my answer. I fully agree. Someday. Excellent. Great. We'll end on agreement. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay.